The Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart Illustrated by Carson Ellis Read to you by Mr. Perez The Waiting Room Rainey sat alone in his room. It was after nine o'clock, and Sticky had still not shown up. A message broadcast had just ended, and Rainey, worn out, was making himself go over the day's notes one last time. For once, he was glad to be studying his lessons. Studying helped take his mind off worse things. He'd even been grateful for the message broadcast, which was so irritating and made it so difficult to concentrate that he had no space left over in his brain to worry about Sticky. Even so, Rainy felt awful. And now, to make matters worse, he smelled something awful too. His nose wrinkled with disgust. What was that? Had something crawled under the floor and died? Then the door opened. It was Sticky. He was covered in slimy, black, stinking mud, and he walked into the room like a zombie. From his red, hugely swollen eyes, it was obvious that he'd been crying for hours. But it wasn't the eyes themselves that caught Rainy's heart. It was their look of total despair. Rainy leaped up and threw his arms around Sticky. You're out! Sticky pulled away without speaking. He removed his spectacles, studied their mud-spotted lenses, and set them on his desk without bothering to clean them. Then, still without saying a word, he went out of the room. Rainy grabbed some of Sticky's things and ran out after him. In the corridor, he squeezed past two helpers, already mopping up Sticky's muddy footprints in weird silence. A couple of boys were leaving the bathroom holding their noses and trying not to step in the muddy spots on the floor. Rainy ran into the bathroom. Sticky had stepped into a shower stall without undressing and was trying to grip the faucet handle, but his slimy hand kept slipping off. Finally, he grabbed it with both hands and wrenched on the hot water. He flinched when the spray struck his face. Then he stood impassively, eyes closed, as black water swirled at his feet. Rainy watched him anxiously. I brought you some soap, Sticky, and a towel, and clean clothes. Sticky made no reply. Hey, get undressed and use this soap, all right? After Rainy had repeated this several times, Sticky gave a dull nod and reached for the soap. Rainy washed up at the sinks. He was filthy and rank from hugging Sticky. Then went to the room, changed clothes, and waited. He stared at the door, afraid of what was coming, afraid to have his suspicions confirmed. He'd been doing his best to remain calm, but he was trembling all over. He felt sure Sticky had been brain-swept. And Mr. Curtin wouldn't erase Sticky's memories just for cheating, would he? If not, then why had this happened? What crime would call for such a terrible action? There seemed to be only one answer. Sticky had told Mr. Curtin everything. When Sticky finally returned, he dumped his wet clothes in the corner, put on his muddy glasses without cleaning them, and then, without once looking at Rainy, he pulled his suitcase from beneath the bed. Sticky, what's happening? No reply. You have to talk to me, Sticky. I'm afraid something terrible's happened to you. Not just the waiting room, I mean, but something even worse. In a dull tone, just tinged with anger, Sticky said, I don't suppose there's anything worse than that place. What would you know about that? Rainy caught his breath. Sticky remembered the waiting room, and, come to think of it, he remembered where his suitcase was. There was still hope. You're right, Sticky. I don't know anything that happened. Can you tell me? I don't want to talk about it, Sticky said, opening the wardrobe with trembling fingers. And I don't intend to go back there, 
I'm running away. They told me Mr. Curtin couldn't see me today, that SQ will come for me again in the morning. I'm to meet, I'm to meet with Mr. Curtin if he's available. So either I'll have to go back to that, that nightmare, or else I'll have to face Mr. Curtin, where I'm certain to go to pieces, Rainy, where I'm certain to lose control and tell on you and everyone else. The more Sticky spoke, the more emotion crept into his voice, until at last, shaking, he covered his eyes and dropped to his knees. I can't do it, Rainy. I can't go back there. And I can't face Mr. Curtin without failing you. I just can't. I have to leave. I have no choice. Rainy's eyes suddenly filled with tears. Listen to me, Sticky. I'm, I'm so sorry for what you've been through. Really, I am. But I can't tell you how glad I am that you're still here. I thought they'd taken your memory. But it's still you in there. Still my good friend. Not for much longer, Sticky said miserably. I'm going to crack, Rainy. You know how badly I handle pressure. I'll flub it tomorrow, and you'll all be caught. What kind of a friend will I be then? Rainy closed his suitcase. You're not going to flub anything. How can you know? I can see it in you, Rainy said with perfect conviction. You'd hold fast tomorrow, even if I didn't have a plan, which I do. When your friends really need you, they can count on you. I just know it. And I do need you, Sticky. I need you here as a friend. Sticky's eyes flickered like a candle on the verge of guttering. It's nice of you to say, he said doubtfully. Then he shuddered. But Rainy, it'll kill me if I have to go back to that place. All those hours, with every second crawling by, and other things crawling by, things you can't see, constantly sinking into that goop, the smell so horrible, like something dead, like maybe it's yourself that's dead. You don't have to spend another day in there, Rainy said. I swear it. You bet your boots you won't, said Kate, whose head appeared in the ceiling above them. She lowered Constance into the room. If they send you back there, we'll find a way to get you out, no matter what, okay, chum? Shakily, Sticky rose to his feet. It's going to be all right, Rainy said. I'm sure you'll see Mr. Curtin first thing in the morning. But that's no good either. It's terrible. How can I keep from giving you all away? He knows we're friends. He knows I was cheating. And he'll just put two and two together. Sticky caught his breath held it for a moment, and started over. Okay, you mentioned a plan, didn't you? Do you really have one? I'll tell you about it, Rainy said, handing him a roll. But first, you should eat. I smuggled some food for you. For the first time, Sticky's eyes brightened and stayed bright. I am awfully hungry. Ten o'clock, roared Jackson from just outside the door. Everyone jumped. No one had heard him creeping down the hallway. Lights out! As he hurried to the light switch, Rainy gave Kate a questioning look. We turned ours off before we left, she said a little too loudly. Immediately, Jackson rapped on the door. Do you boys have someone in there? You know it's against the rule. No room visits, period. And even more no room visits during lights out. It's just the two of us, Rainy replied. This is just what Jackson had hoped Rainy would say. If he caught the boys with visitors now, they were not only breaking one of the Institute's very few rules, but lying about it as well. He flung the door open and switched on the light. Aha, there you... But he cut himself short, for he saw only the two boys sitting on the floor. Isn't the light supposed to be off? Rainy asked him. With a scowl, Jackson reached and turned off the light, then thought better of it. Not just yet, he said, strolling over to the wardrobe. First, I'd like to see what you have in here. He threw open the wardrobe doors. Nothing but clothes inside. If you don't mind, we'd like to get some sleep. Sticky's had a long day.
And whose fault is that? Jackson said, kneeling to look beneath the bottom bunk. Only the boy's suitcases. He rose and stared at Rainey, who smiled pleasantly, and then at Sticky, who only shrugged. Jackson sneered. How did you like the waiting room, George? Rainey suddenly boiled over with anger. He had spent the evening in such a state of emotion. He couldn't seem to stop himself. How can you do that to people, Jackson? Send them to a place like that and then tease them about it. Jackson feigned puzzlement. What do you mean, a place like that? The waiting room isn't such a bad place. And it's perfectly safe. A little mud never hurt anyone. Washes right off, doesn't it? It may have been a bit of an odor, but an odor can't, an odor can't hurt you more than mud can, or darkness for that matter. Darkness is good for you, rests the eyes, prevents sunburn. Livid though he was, Rainey fought to regain control of himself. He should never have said anything in the first place. It did no good to argue with an executive. Jackson was still lecturing with obvious pleasure. And yes, I suppose there are a great many flies and beetles and crawling things. But they didn't bite or sting, did they? You aren't afraid of a fly, are you, George? No, Sticky replied in an even tone. But he was glaring at Jackson. It was such an angry look, so full of defiant outrage, that Rainey actually felt encouraged. There was strength in Sticky. It was just easy to miss, easiest of all for Sticky himself. Jackson missed it too. Of course you aren't. So let's hear no more nonsense, he said, screwing up his face as if talking to a pitiful baby. About the waiting, about the waiting moon being such a nasty widow place. Then he grinned wickedly, shut off the light, and left the room. His boots thumped away down the corridor. Constance's stifled voice called out. Good grief! Did you intend to keep me in here forever? Quiet, Rainy whispered, peeking out the door. The corridor was empty. He nodded at Sticky, who dragged his suitcase from beneath the bed. It's a good thing you're so small, Sticky whispered as Constance climbed out. Oh yes, lucky me. So small you can pack me in the luggage. Why don't you try curling up in a suitcase? Constance said, forgetting that Sticky had spent his entire day standing in filth, darkness, and bug swarms. The ceiling panel slid aside and Kate dropped down into the room again. Now, what's this about a plan? She said, as if they had never been interrupted. <laughs>